platform to a, to a different place. Good afternoon. And um, my name is Antoinette Samuel, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the National League of Cities. So I want to officially welcome you to the National League of Cities, and in particular, our uh, City County Leadership Center. We're very excited to have both this event here today, as well as to have you uh, join us in uh, what I still call our new facility, although uh, in a couple weeks it'll be one year, and I won't be able to call it new anymore. Also, I want to welcome those who are joining us by the, um, webcast. Um, we're excited about being able to be a part and be a sponsor of this important event and of this important study. Um, the National League of Cities is a membership-based, or I like to say a membership-focused organization, and we represent um, 1,700 direct city members throughout the U.S. Uh, we are an organization that seeks to serve our elected officials by providing them the advocacy, the technical assistance, and the training that they need to lead their communities in a positive way. Um, but actually, we have a network of 49 state municipal leagues. So we pride ourselves in being able to say that both through our direct city members and our 49 state municipal leagues, we represent the interest of 19,000 cities and towns and villages throughout the US. We, as a state, we try to provide training and technical assistance and lobbying and advocacy, all with the intent of being able to equip local officials with the tools that they need to lead their communities and to be effective leaders in that vein. Um, so our members are actually on the forefront of dealing with all of the realities of local governance. And one of those aspects of being a leader is to consider um, those issues related to housing and the housing market in their cities and towns. It is a critical issue. They play a critical role in making sure that um, citizens, both their cities and their citizens, um, have um, adequate housing. Um, and so we're very <coughs> proud to be part of a sponsorship of this event. Because as mentioned, um, housing is a critical issue. The importance of this study, the state of the nation's housing report, is something that um, needs attention. And so I'm very proud to be a partner in this effort. Um, and we appreciate the panelists that are here today. Uh, I know you don't want to hear from me because we have some very important people for you to hear about who are very intimately uh, knowledgeable um, about this study and its effect on local governments and their cities as well. So I give you an official welcome. Uh, I hope that you will take some time after this event. If you're interested in a space, you're welcome to come upstairs to the fourth and fifth floor and visit our space if you, if you like. Um, but I think we need to get on with the important business of this event, and that is to hear about the State of Nations uh, housing report. Um, so I am going to introduce um, Kristen Capps with City Lab, who I believe is going to lead you through a discussion with the panel. And uh, welcome to the National League of Cities, and welcome to Washington, and welcome to our space, and welcome to um, what you're going to get out of this important discussion as well. So thank you very much. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Kristen Capps. I'm a staff writer at City Lab, the urbanism site for The Atlantic. Uh, I'd like to thank the National League of Cities for hosting us in this very nice space. We have a really lovely setup here, uh, and hopefully it will make us all shine. Um, I want to thank our panelists for, for being here. It's a really estimable group, and I think this is going to be a good uh, forum to discuss the State of the Nation's Housing Report for 2017 and the insight it contains. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, first with me is Christopher Herbert, he is the Managing Director for the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Baltimore Mayor Catherine Pugh. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Uh, Terry Ludwig, who is President and CEO of Entermi Enterprise Community Partners, a national nonprofit organization that improves communities and works to make homes affordable. And then Robert Kettler on the end, who is the Chairman and CEO of Kettler, a DC developer of mixed-use housing. Um, for those in the audience, uh, I'd like to ask you to please mute or turn off your cell phones while we're having our discussion today. And for any reporters in the crowd, uh, the panelists will be available for interviews after we conclude um, the proceedings here. Uh, for those watching along at home or uh, for our live stream or um, checking this out on Twitter, the hashtag we're using today is Harvard Housing Report. So that is where all the action will be. 
All right, to start, um, let me ask you, Chris, we're now a decade out from the start of the Great Recession. Uh, things are finally starting to feel back to normal in the housing market in a lot of ways. In 2016, home prices finally broke the pre-recession peak. Uh, home prices are up, construction starts are rising, uh, financial distress among homeowners is on the decline. Uh, but yet renters and home buyers in many metro areas aren't feeling that great about uh, the housing situation. Can you discuss some of the issues, especially in supply, uh, that are hurting housing markets today? Sure. Um, and just before I do that, I just want to give a, a thank you to the Ford Foundation, who is a principal funder of the report. They've been doing that since its inception in 1988. Uh, to the Policy Advisory Board of the Joint Center for Housing Studies, and there's an, uh, a number of organizations that are also sponsors that are listed in the report, including the National League of Cities. So we just, the Joint Center is very grateful for all those support for the report. But to get to your question, yeah. you know, it's definitely the case the housing market is getting back to normal, and I think we do have to put that in a little bit of quotes uh, in part, because uh, as we point out, the house price nationally are finally back to peak. Uh, and the reason why that's important is because what it means is that people who bought at the peak, who refinanced at the peak, are no longer underwater or under equity. And that, that's an important landmark for, for, uh, for the market. Another key way in which the market's getting back to normal is the rate of growth of households, which was anemic in the years after the bust, is now getting back up to what we think is this long-term trend. And those are two really important metrics for the market. But I think what we're seeing this year in particular is one way it's really not back to normal, even though construction's up, it's up for seventh year in a row, but we're now at a level of housing starts a little under 1.2 million that back in previous recessions would have been near the bottom of that recession. Mm -hmm. If we look back over the last 10 years, we've added 9 million housing units to the housing stock. That's the lowest ever for a 10 year period. Ever. And, ever. And if you look at what um, was typically done in the post-war period, it's about 14 to 15 million housing units. So we have been adding a lot less housing over the last 10 years. And even though it's picking up, when you put that against rising demand, you end up with very tight housing markets. For sale markets, the number of months available is, uh, is 3.6 months, hasn't been that low in, in many years. Uh, and the rental market is at the lowest rate for vacancies in 30 years. Even though we have been adding more, more rental housing, not enough to keep up with demand. And the result, to your point, what people are feeling in the market is they're starting to get jobs, their income is going up, and when they go in the housing market, those prices are going up and rents are going up because we don't have enough supply. Hmm. Nine million units. Um, uh, Mayor Pugh, I want to ask you, uh, you know, well, this, the State of the Nation's housing report discusses supply in, in great detail. It highlights the issue of tight housing supply across the country. Um, it also makes the case that conditions vary really widely between metro areas and even within metro areas, from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, parts of Baltimore, the problem you're facing is not one of, of lack of supply, but maybe large numbers of vacant homes. Uh, what approaches is Baltimore City planning to to deal with with that specific problem of vacant homes. Well, first of all, I think we could debate whether or not you know Baltimore is suffering from the same problems economically that other jurisdictions have suffered from, and that the state of housing has to be tied to the economy in terms of how it has impacted communities and neighborhoods for decades. Uh -huh. and when you think about board of housing, I mean, we've got all kinds of programs. Whether it is the Vacancy of Values program, you know, there was a time when there was something like forty thousand board of houses in Baltimore City. Uh, and now we're down to something like 14,000 and about 6,000 that are owned by the city. And so there are a lot of policies and so forth that we're looking, for, looking at. But how you work with your state and federal government, I think, is really important. For example, we've got $75 million that's committed by the state by virtue of the work that we did at the legislative level just to Baltimore City to tear down boarded up homes. And what you see as a result of that is people being able to put larger uh, footprints in communities. And if you will go over, for example, in Eagle Park, where Johns Hopkins made a tremendous investment, uh, live near where you work, putting in $35,000 per individual who would live in those communities. And now you see where thousands of homes have been torn down and a new community has been developed. You see the same thing happening on the west side of Baltimore. And then you see it yeah. now moving up uh, to different corridors. So I would say when you look at the housing market in Baltimore, what we've got to make sure that we're paying close attention to is affordable housing for everyone. Because while home ownership, while homes are being built, 
so are apartment buildings. Millenniums today are choosing not to buy homes, but to rent, and that certainly is having its impact. But we don't care who owns the property as long as we're getting the taxes. So uh, right, what, right. We, what we do know about Baltimore is the two fastest growing populations, 18 to 34, 55 years of age and older. Millenniums think um, Baltimore is number six on the millennium scale of places to live. So we think we've got, we're moving in the right direction. Really grateful to many of the developers who are now pouring into Baltimore. If you come in now, you'll see the cranes up in the sky. You'll see neighborhoods being redeveloped. And you'll see a mayor taking control of investment in her city, especially on corridors that heretofore have not been invested in. For example, we do get slots impact money. And so when we yeah. look at the Park Heights community, creating those same kinds of incentives that Johns Hopkins uh, did on the east side of Baltimore, we realize now that we can do that. So we now we've got a major companies coming in and looking at developing in Baltimore. So we're excited about our housing market. Mayor Pugh, let me ask you a follow-up question. How important are those anchor institutions, whether it's Johns Hopkins or Maryland Institute College of Art, to developing those areas that are attractive to millennials? They become the attraction for uh -huh. development. You know, because when you're building around your, I call them our assets, the colleges, the universities, the hospitals, the, even the uh, museums, all of those are, and the parks, all of those are attractions that uh, developers want to be near water, which is why it was so easy in the early days to develop around the Inner Harbor and still growing in development. You know, and now we're moving away from the harbor east, south, and west because people want to live around water, they want to live around parks, they want to live near hospitals. And again, when you think about that fast growing population of 54 and, and over, and they're usually less expensive to a city because they've come back because they enjoy walking around neighborhoods. They enjoy being able to walk to the grocery store. Right. They enjoy being able to have to not you know, worry about how to be transported from one place to the other. So it's working. Great. Um, <clears throat> Bob, I'd like to ask you the next question. Um, in contrast to the problem of boarded up homes or excess vacancies, uh, the State of the Nation's Housing Report documents that nationally construction of multifamily housing has actually been at its highest level since the 1980s. Um, much of this new construction, particularly in high-cost cities, however, seems to tilt overwhelmingly toward luxury. Uh, and when that trend is combined with rising rents overall, the result is strong growth in high rent units and declines in those with more affordable rents. Um, let's take an example here in Washington. Uh, DC. We could show this chart of rent distribution here in Washington. Can you talk about some of the reasons why developers have focused so much on luxury apartments and what it would take in this metro area to build more affordable apartments? There's a lot in that question. And we can also look yes. specifically yes. at this. Yes. So the um, uh, the the bottom line is cost. So the, in, in terms of building in urban, anything that is first structured parking, second over four stories. He agrees with me. <laughs> Sounds very smart. <laughs> OK, minor snafu, so I hope we've got that under control. Okay. Two bobs is better than one, but <laughs> continue. In harmony. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, you were saying you had you're, you're parking, anything over four stories? Yeah, over, over four stories, um, particularly if it's built out of concrete, structured parking. Uh, uh -huh. those, those types of buildings are um, inherently very expensive, $200,000, $300,000 a unit. When you combine that with land costs that are also now approaching, in some cases, $150,000, $150 a foot, $200 a foot, 14th Street quarter over near Union Market. It's impossible to even build a unit uh, for much under $450,000 to $550,000. Wow. So wow. even if you were doing it at cost, your rents would still be in the $350, $4, four and a quarter. So, so what we've been doing to mitigate that, that's just the reality of it, and there's no, there's no way to make that less. There's no subsidy or anything else at, at, at that particular market level. So, so we've been trying to make smaller units. So we've, we've come out with a whole line of units called the flats, where we used to have 950 feet. We're now at 625 feet uh -huh. across the board for 
or units, and we've come up with a pod unit that has what could be a prefabricated core. Uh, we've just built our first prototype of that up in Adams Morgan. Uh -huh. so, so we're doing things to mitigate costs to bring that down more towards people that earn in the 45 to say $80,000 range, if, okay? And then there's a real bifurcation in costs. I mean, the upper end of the market is very, very hot. As a matter of fact, there's even oversupply there because, because it's, it's just, that's basically where all the product's landing. What we're doing to really actually revitalize and bring in um, lower cost units uh, it is, a, is a very long answer and it's not just an urban solution. We don't have an urban solution for affordable housing at our company. We've, we did 7,000 tax credit units between 1994 and 2006. Uh, the margins in that got squeezed out. We needed to have, uh, and we've built maybe 2,000 units here in Washington, D.C. of affordable housing. Uh, this tax credit or bond financed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's currently either you know say Section Eight or vouchers, but but um, we don't see a solution for that. I mean the real answer is it needs to be stick built, surface parked. We're actually doing something in, inside the Beltway Prince George's County that will be in that level and, and be affordable for thirty five to forty thousand uh, dollar incomes. But that's really the only solution is is but not coming lower cost. Construction yeah. costs and surface park. But Chris, Chris did I, you have something to add? Yeah, just what uh, you know, that, that exhibit we had up showed the, the distribution of rents. We got a question a lot of times is like, we're building a lot of luxury housing. We need more moderate cost housing. We're building too much luxury housing. I think, as Bob said, in some markets that may be the case. In a lot of markets, there's still demand for that. Right. And the issue yeah. is, is that we need supply along that whole cost spectrum. Right. So I think you can't say we don't need that high end housing. We've had a growth of 1.6 million over the last 10 years in people making more than 100,000 who are renting. Mm -hmm. That's phenomenal growth, and that's what's been fueling that supply. What we need to do is what Bob's doing is talking about is expand the range of supply, um, and probably at some point pause a little bit on some of that high end in certain markets. But it's really how do we get housing at all those those price points? What that chart shows is we haven't seen a, a process of filtering. We're adding at the high end reduces rents at the low end because demand is so strong. We can't just rely on filtering. We need to add at all those price points sometimes with subsidies. Mayor, is part of that because in many cities or communities it's been developer driven as opposed to leadership uh, saying you know this is what we need and that uh, when I think about the growth and wealth in Baltimore City for example I mean we can't build enough for wealthy individuals who want to move back to the city so there is that market yeah. and I believe that we're meeting that market but how we make sure that affordable housing still is maintained in certain communities. And I think it's easier in communities that have been underdeveloped when you couple that with federal dollars, when you couple that with state dollars and say, you know, part of what we want to do here with the millions of dollars that you're allocating for us to tear down properties, um, which lowers the cost for the development that can take place in those communities and those neighborhoods. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it in Baltimore being done. Well, Terry, let me ask you what, do you, what do you see at Enterprise as some of the, um, the, the, the best or newest or shining solutions for addressing kind of rental affordability and meeting that, meeting that demand? Sure. Um, well, as you just heard from panelists, it's, it's very hard. It's very complicated and complex. But I do believe that with vision and leadership, uh, as uh, the mayor was just saying, you know, being intentional about being committed to affordable housing where it's needed is absolutely what we need to do. And certainly the supply issues, the market-driven solutions that we were just talking about are important um, because just to increase the supply so that we do have some filtering down at entry level. But I would say some of the traditional tools also that have been used for affordable housing, so things like the low-income housing tax credit, mm -hmm. while the margins absolutely have been squeezed. Um, it's still a very highly productive program, which is you know, generating about 100,000 units of either new or preserved affordable housing every year, and also creating about 100,000 jobs in the same time and driving revenue for municipalities that are, are generating that affordable housing. So I do think that that is important, and that's probably been 3 million of the units that have been built since the inception of the program. Mm -hmm. And so definitely there is a shortage of tax credits today. So we're certainly um, supportive of, of expanding that program like there's current legislation to do so with a uh, Cantwell Hatch bill um, as well as uh, a companion bill in the House. So we're certainly supportive of that. Um, 
but it, it, these deals are complicated, um, and they, but they are so important because as we we're just saying, um, there are so many millennials and seniors who are choosing to rent either by necessity or choice. Mm -hmm. And so, and we know from the report there, you know, the renter incomes are about half that of of homeowners and on average. And so this is gonna become just an increasing problem for our country. So I think it's a really important time to act. And I would say we also think, you know, we have to, have to look back at some of the traditional avenues to like vouchers. Mm -hmm. So only one in four of the families that are eligible for vouchers today are able to get those vouchers. So, and there's, you know, many sort of mm -hmm. state and local solutions that have to be customized for their own communities, but things like inclusionary zoning, how you actually fuel good in inclusionary zoning policies so that you also, um, something we might want to talk about later, but, um, you know, we're seeing also concentration of poverty. Right. We need to think about also how we make sure that we are building uh, affordable units in higher opportunity communities. And inclusionary zoning has been one of those strategies that not only creates the units, but also helps us to think about things like economic mobility. So that's just some of the things I would think about. And, and I also think when you talk about Section 8 housing and RAD programs and those programs that have come about, that you really have to take a different look at what Section 8 stood for 20, 30, 40 years ago and what it means today. Because people aren't moving into Section 8 housing and expecting to move out in two or three years or five years because originally it was set up so that you could help people and then they would move on. But the reality is, is that they're not moving on. That what right. you're actually doing is building uh, communities. And I think you have to take in account that that is in fact the case. Because when you go into a Section 8 community or, or using Section 8 through or using RAD programs to develop affordable housing, realize that those people intend to be there. They see it as home. And, and oftentimes city leaders over the years have seen it as, you know, we're building up this role of people. Some are gonna roll in and some are gonna roll out. The reality is that many of them will never roll out until, you know, this is home and this is where they're gonna be. And I think those considerations have to be taken. We're going to talk about Cosford in, in a minute here, but uh, as a brief reminder, we are going to have questions later. And for those watching on the live stream, uh, you can submit questions through Twitter by using the hashtag Harvard Housing Report. Uh, so go ahead and do that. Thank you. Um, so we're talking about the need for vouchers. So I would like to bring up the fact that uh, under the current uh, budget proposal, uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development is looking at $6.2 billion in budget cuts. Uh, this includes gutting entire categories of housing aid, um, budget cuts that if they are passed would be devastating to a wide range of communities across this country. So Terry, maybe you could talk about why this issue isn't getting more traction politically, it isn't getting more traction uh, across all of these communities that will be affected. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, housing has not never been, I think, at the top of our political agenda. But I do say that now, as we start to see what is happening in cities and the incredible affordability crisis we have, we are starting to see it have traction. I think if we look back at the election in November on you know nine of nine sort of state ballots, uh, where we're lo our local, state, and local ballots where we were looking to fund affordable housing were passed. So I think you're starting to see that kind of interest. But in general, I would say housing is viewed just, you know, as a consumer market. And, you know, I think also people start to look at these numbers that we're talking about and saying this crisis is so big that it is very mm -hmm. hard to imagine a solution. So I think it's also incumbent upon us all to talk about what are those real solutions and how we could scale those. Because I think, you know, people honestly have a little bit of crisis overload, particularly in this political environment. Mm -hmm. So how we actually put forward that there are real and tangible solutions I think is is really important. I also think it's just as important to be advocating for this. Um, you know, those kind of budget cuts would be absolutely devastating. And some of the programs I just talked about, like low-income housing tax credit, they work in conjunction with other things that are in the budget that would be appropriated. So things like CDBG right. or Red. home funds. Red. You can't, then we really have, um, you know, some serious issues. So... And, and I think I think she's absolutely right. You have to, we have to be advocating. And I hope it doesn't appear that we're not, you know, <laughs> heading to the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, uh, to discuss our proposals for the federal government right. and being on Capitol Hill, you know, advocating on behalf of the citizens of Baltimore and the state of Maryland. You know, our focus is on the things that you talk about, the president talks about that needs to be done, fixing infrastructure, improving urban environments. So 
if uh, he's not hearing the message, our hope is that he hears our message that it's absolutely important to the growth and development of cities that we invest in housing first, that we look at economic generation. And when you talk about federal mandates to fix infrastructures of cities and so forth, part of that is what we do with our housing stock as well. Absolutely. Yeah, that's fascinating, especially as uh, the, the role and, and the kind of alignment of state government changes, that changes the role of mayors, too, in the way that they serve as advocates. Well, I can tell you, as um, an, a new mayor who's only been in office for about six months, and I can't say that much longer, <laughs> but when um, President-elect Trump came to Baltimore for the Army-Navy game, yes. I made arrangements to be able to hand him a letter on behalf of the citizens of Baltimore in terms of infrastructure needs, housing needs, and um, federal appropriations that are very much needed. I think we have to meet this administration on the words that they put out there and on what they say they want to do. And we've got to be strong advocates. We've got to continue to say what needs to be said. And we can't retreat. We have to move forward. But again, we have to have conversations. And those conversations can begin with the conversations that he initiated when he said, I, when he put his hand on the Bible, saying, I'm the president of the United States of America. Right. And that means all of us. Right. I would just agree, echo what the mayor said, which is to say that just being able to frame housing as an economic imperative, um, it's a basic need for folks if we want to be economically competitive. And we're seeing that with employers, right? Because if you want to attract, retain, and not have the kind of turnover that you might see otherwise in the, you know, in the job market, it's just absolutely imperative. And one of the most effective ways I think that we've seen housing framed also has been in really a human sense. So I think you know Matt Desmond, who authored the book Evicted, gave us a great uh, gift when he talked about um, you know the importance of housing stability on real life outcomes, on families, on education outcomes, on health outcomes, and being able to tell that kind of story of that stability um, is. I think also really important. We have to remember to tell what what does that mean to the child that just born? What does that mean to their life trajectory? So those are things I think we can all continue to do a better job on. Absolutely. And I, I would just also add that you know I think this framing of the story as housing as a part of economic mobility is important. Um, you know the mayor talked about the fact that people move into these communities and there, there's no next step on the ladder to move out right. of. But there's also an opportunity in those communities through things like the family self sufficiency program and the like to to, to help give that housing community uh, a leg up in terms of job training, other access to, to economic mobility. You know, and I, I think the one other thing I'd point out too is I feel we need to have an honest conversation about how we can do things better. Yes. And we can do things better. Absolutely. And I think uh, the mayor of Baltimore, mayors across the country are experimenting and pushing the envelope, enterprise community partners and the like are all finding how do we do better? Um, but we, you know, we need to first have that commitment to t address the problem. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, from the private developer standpoint, yeah. too, I mean, the, we're not so in, as involved in, say, policy, but the inclusionary uh, zoning components in all of the zonings we're doing from D.C. and Tyson's Corner are much higher proportions than they have been historically. I mean, mm -hmm. in D.C., they're trying to ratchet it up from 8% to 12%. We're trying to make that work in our budgets. And not only that, they're asking us to do it on a square footage basis, not just on a unit count basis. And they're asking us to distribute those units proportionately through the building in the same ratio as, as the rest of the mix. So it isn't, you're, you're not sort of um, pigeonholing the, the affordable units into lower floors or into smaller units. No so, corridors. Uh, yeah, yeah, no corridors. But that, no, they're, they're distributed through the units and yeah. they're sort of invisible, which is great. They're part of the community. And we endorse all of, all of that. You know, the, the important thing there is to get it into the budgetary process earlier rather than later, not in the middle of a, a, a land use action because that can blow it up. And, you know, in Baltimore, that's been my experience is whatever we're doing it was, has been up front. And in 90% of what happens around Virginia and D.C., it's baked into the land use. So it definitely can be worked into it, uh, and, and particularly if you're doing high-rise construction. It doesn't work where you've got low-rise construction because the density bonus, you can't, you can't physically make it work. But you can make it work in concrete and vertical construction. I, I think what makes cities unique is that when you think about a housing and you think about community development. And I think when you focus on community <laughs> development and then the future of retail, 
And the great thing about cities is that we're not all encumbered with great big malls that are trying to figure out what their next footprint is going to be. Uh, if you're looking at housing, you're also looking at what kind of re retail establishments are you going to build. You know, um, when you think about supermarkets, for example, they're no longer looking for 120,000. Uh, what they're looking at is yeah. 25,000, 40,000. And, you know, in spite of the internet, and we, we love the internet because it certainly has changed the way that we do business, but there's certain things that will always take place. Uh, I would tell people you can't get your hair done over the internet. You're still going to have to go someplace in the neighborhood and community. Never. And, um, <laughs> and cleaning. Nice. Uh, and we're winning. We're winning. We're women. We know, we know this. <laughs> you can't debate me on that one. But, um, but how, we, how we buy our clothes and all those kinds of things, that retail footprint changes. So you'll see the whole community development piece. Uh, coupled with housing, change in terms of how we address communities, build out communities, revive neighborhoods and communities that have been neglected over decades, that create border right. houses and communities. So it is an opportunity for us to now look at how do we reshape development and how do we reshape community development and housing in neighborhoods and make it affordable for everyone. Yeah, and I would. It's interesting because you know, we think about the role of technology. Um, you know, it is really cutting down traditional geographies and barriers. And also, it's changing the way we form community. And while we will still do that in a physical setting, just doing that in a more digital environment, mm -hmm. I think is, is fascinating. We've just recently had some conversations, in addition to the kind of innovation that you're talking about, some of the smaller units and the pods or the manufactured housing. Right. You know, today, here in our country, as well as in other places, there's 3D printing that's occurring. So there's all kinds of ways to think about how technology might be disruptive to do the exact kind of thing that Chris said, which is to say, how do we hold ourselves accountable and use you know, new technologies to try to reduce some of these barriers? Well, I say we take advantage of this technology we have behind us and put up another chart <laughs> uh, on cost burden. This is one I've been, I've, been waiting, I've been dying to get to because I think it's really fascinating and one of the important revelations um, from this report, where we see um, real market improvement in the number of homeowners who are paying more than half of their uh, income toward housing, what would you would call the severe cost burden category, um, but much less so among renters. So Chris, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about the conclusions from this report. Sure. So if you look at that, those trends, you'll see that over the course of the 2000s, both of those numbers were, were rising up until the time of the, the crest of the housing uh, uh, boom. And among homeowners, it was because people were stretching to get into homes. The lending was allowing them to take on, on bigger burdens. Um, that crested about 2010 or so. And then since then, it's come down, down by about 2 million, which seems like good news, except when you consider the fact that a lot of the decline had to do with the fact that people who were most stressed lost their home to foreclosure. Uh -huh. uh, and, the, and the other piece of that is the fact that young people are not moving into home ownership. And, and that's the group that tends to stretch the most and be the most cost burden. Now, the fact that they're not spending more than 50% is a good thing, but that, that decline reflects that kind of the struggles in the housing market. Part of it probably reflects the fact, too, that we've had interest rates below 4%. So if you were on the bubble, you could refinance and get your costs down. On the renter side, what we saw was rent, rental burdens were rising over the first course of the decade. And since the recession had took off, they went from about 9 million to 11 million. And they've been there pretty stable around 11 million for the last four years. And that number, you know, just a decade ago, it was around it was six and a half million. Just an enormous increase in people spending half of their income on housing. And so we've seen just the fact that it's not getting any worse. It edged down last year by a couple hundred thousand. You might see a headline that says rental affordability improves. But relative to last year, but relative to where it was as little as 2,000, it's just enormous, that number. And so what we're seeing now is that renter incomes are going up as the economy gets near full appointment. But as we've talked about, rents are going up faster. So when you have yeah. rents going up faster than incomes, it's just keeping that pressure on. And so this is a problem that we're not able to grow our way out of. Um, so we're going to have, as Bob was talking about earlier, we've got to find a way, and Terry and the mayor, how do we find housing that, because most of this group, most of that 11 million, six and a half million of that are people making less than $15,000 a year, and another three and a half million are making between 15 and 30. So this is a group that Bob's going to have a hard time building housing at a price that he can make a living on, mm -hmm. um, and so we have to find some way to reach that 11 million if we're going to see that number go down. And, and I think that's where we talk about tax credit programs and subsidies, you know, when you think about yeah. Johns Hopkins putting in 35000 dollars per person to 
get folks to live in a certain part of the city. And then when I talk about what we're looking at in Park Heights, instead of um, them taking the slots impact money that comes to the city and try to spread it all over the place, we say use it to subsidize folks uh, who want to be homeowners and then subsidize developers who want to develop in that particular area. Mm -hmm. Because I think what you pointed out earlier, it's how do you bring that cost down? And we're still going to have to bring costs down in order to be able to accommodate the affordable marketplace that needs homes as well. I also think that there needs to be some there, there needs to be something said about mortgage bankers luring people into homes that they cannot afford to be in, and and there ought to be. And I know that there is for some some retribution around that because these are people who probably will never get back into home ownership because they're going to be struggling still trying to figure right. their way out of the debt they're now. Know, that they're now under. Mm -hmm. So I think um, this whole education piece around home ownership, I never forget when I bought my first home, I said, when rent gets to, and now this really tells how old you are, when rent gets to 500, I'm out. <laughs> I'm buying a home. <laughs> and then when I bought a home, I said, you know, this is an equity opportunity. And so what I want to do, because I'm one of those folks who never knows what they're going to be doing next, I want to pay for my home as quickly as I can. Sure. So I took out a 15 year mortgage. And every time I had a little bit of extra money, I put it on my principal. I said, who tells people that? And so instead of taking 15 years to pay for a house, I paid for it in 12. But, we took, but the average person will go to the bank and say, if they got a little extra money, this is for my mortgage, not realizing that they're paying on their interest. So right. there's a lot of education that needs to take place in terms of home ownership so that we don't end up with people who went through what they just went through in terms of you know, losing their homes. Well, maybe. Mayor Pugh, you can kind of continue on that thought. I want to talk about African American home ownership mm -hmm. rates, which are um, down from where they were before the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968, which is really sad and astonishing. Yeah. Fact, Absolutely. If you think about it. And what are some policies that you see that can, or that you envision that can help um, put black households into home, home ownership? Well, I think the American dream is still everybody's dream, and in, in the African American community as well. Yeah. But part of it, I think you can't um, deny the economic inclusion has not been fair across the board. And so what we've got to do is be able to be more economically inclusive of all communities to increase the opportunity for African Americans and other minorities to be able to become homeowners. And uh, when we look at, in Baltimore City, for example, when we look at neighborhoods that are depressed where unemployment is at its highest, um, it is in those neighborhoods. We know, for example, that because of research that has been done, the top 10 major neighborhoods where unemployment are at its highest are in African American communities. Mm -hmm. And so um, all of that home ownership certainly is tied to affordability, but it's also tied to economic opportunity. And so it becomes incumbent upon, upon those of us who lead to create a more inclusive economic opportunity platform for people who live in your city by virtue of offering them the opportunities to participate in business opportunities, job opportunities, and we've just got to do a better job of doing that so that we can increase ownership among African Americans and other minorities in this country. So, so okay, I'll just yeah. you know, add that you know, one of the things the report highlights is uh, over the next 10 years, what would, do we expect to see in terms of household growth? The good news is that we expect the country to have very strong household growth, which is good for the housing market, good for the economy. A challenge for the country is that 70% of that growth is going to be among households of color. Uh, African Americans, Hispanic are going to be a big part of that market, yeah. as well as Asians. And so if we're thinking about realizing the growth of that, the, the economic potential of that growth, we have to make sure the housing market works for all those segments of the, of the uh, country. Homeownership is a piece of that. Rental housing obviously is important as well, but in the homeownership yeah. side, it brings us back, I think, to what we're talking about in terms of the housing finance system and how we're going to reform that system going forward. And you know, if you look particularly at uh, where African Americans and low-income first-time homebuyers are getting their financing, it's FHA. The FHA program is right. incredibly important. And so certainly when we talk about GSE reform, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the role of the government in that market, we have to think about it in the context of the fact that we're going to be this uh, majority minority country over the next half dec half century. And we have to think about FHA. FHA has not been enough part of that conversation uh, because yeah. it has continued to be an incredibly important source for the, for the, for the market. So um, I just want to you know, say that that is part of the thinking about the minority home ownership. That's a key part of the policy discussion. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. That's, we, we have housing, for sale housing projects, 12 of them uh, around the area. And 
and the FHA loan, the 3% down payment, the 3% starter rates are, are incredible uh, right now. And we, we have seminars for teaching to, to get credit scores up and to get people into home ownership uh, from Stafford County all the way up to Baltimore. So. Well, and, and that's why I said, you know, access to capital is important. Education is also important. And, you know, teaching people about credit. I mean, this is just not the African-American community. This is folks in general. But we need that education. And at the same time, we need the economic access. And that has heretofore been a problem in many African-American and, and communities of color. But I do think that if we're looking forward to how do we revive the housing market in this country, yeah. we certainly have to be paying attention to the population that's growing. Well, with the prospect of rising interest rates, uh, do you have any fear that FHA loans will be less effective or less attractive for first-time home buyers? Yes. I mean, yeah. uh, and, uh, and that goes for rental, the rental side of the equation as well as the homeownership side. It's, um, but it could, it could be really put a dent in the for sale housing market any increase in the rates. So, I mean, traditionally what happens is people go from the fixed rate into some form of a variable rate loan or adjustable rate loan. And that can soften the blow, but in the long run, raising, uh, rising interest rates really are harmful. Do you think, it's, it's, do you think, think it's, it's appropriate it's, right now? I mean, we have the job growth. We don't see the inflation. Well, <laughs> the, the Fed raised rates and bond prices uh, um, went up. So that meant yeah. rates on long bonds went down. So, so I don't think it's actually affecting the mortgage market and or the long bond market or even the HUD 221D4 market. I, I think all of those are fairly stable and nobody really sees those rates moving up really this year. Maybe a tiny amount, but not enough to really dent uh, home buying or I think the um, construction or permanent um, loan industry on, on multifamily. But there are some local policies that you can put in place, as we've done at the city and state level, whether yeah. it is the first time home buyers uh, tax credit or the $5,000 that if you're a teacher or a police officer or something like that, that you can get. So there are some things that we as cities and states can continue to do to help, A, lower that burden and increase the population of individuals who have access to the housing market. Great. We're going to open it up uh, to some questions uh, here in a minute. I want to remind people who are watching through the live stream, you can submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag Harvard Housing Report, and hopefully we will um, get to everything that we want to cover. Um, to look at one last chart uh, from the uh, State of the Nation's Housing Report, uh, there's been um, you know alarming changes in the number of high poverty uh, neighborhoods and in the um, What's kind of the suburbanization and exurban poverty of uh, uh, that, that kind of concentration. So I was hoping, Terry, you could kind of discuss um, the increase in the number of high poverty neighborhoods, both in high density urban areas, but also in lower density suburbs, those kind of inner ring suburbs where you're starting to see you know, a great deal of pover poverty start to migrate. Sure. Um these are all really, really tough issues, obviously. So welcome the panel's thoughts here. Um, you know, I guess what I would say is it's clear that, you know, poverty is getting pushed out of the urban core in many places into, you know, suburban markets, et cetera. And I think that's exactly, you know, what we're seeing. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there are, it's, it's a very challenging problem. I guess I would say it's also challenging because we know that it's not just about housing when you're getting pushed out. Uh, your access to opportunity as a family, it changes, right? And so you're getting pushed out often, and you know some of the things the report talks about are you know, housing plus transportation costs, for example. So when you start to look at that picture for a family who's already struggling with relatively flat wage growth and you know increasing housing costs, it becomes really problematic. Um, you know, I guess I would say that, you know, there are some of the policies that we've already talked about today, like inclusionary zoning, some land use policies that can certainly address this. Um, but I think it's, um, it also gets down a little bit to public will. Of, and I think we're seeing some of these communities respond in very different ways. You know, some saying, yes, I understand there's affordability crisis and I'll use all the tools in my toolbox, if you will, you know, land use, inclusionary zoning, uh, opening up uh, even source of income kind of strategies uh, to allow more affordable housing to be built or to be preserved. Um, there are other communities that are 
probably quite exclusionary and would prefer to stay exclusionary right. and really aren't going to make it uh, any easier to have you know, a range and really drive the economic inclusion that we were you know, speaking about earlier. So um, there's no doubt that this trend is happening and, uh, and we're seeing it evidence in people's lives. You know? so, so it's an important trend to keep our eye on. And I think it's, it's not only often economic segregation, but it's also racial segregation Absolutely. in many ways. Mm -hmm. So. And, and what we've also seen is, uh, you know, vouchers aren't limited by virtue of a city or, you know, or a particular jurisdiction. Right. So now you get it because they're federal. So you get right. a Section 8 voucher, you can go move into uh, other parts of the state. And so you see the poverty spreading out. But it also, I think you make a good point, it also creates more problems for those who are in poverty, access to assistance and help and support. And we saw it even in our school system. We looked up and we said, well, what happened to those 2,000 students? And we'll, oh, well, they now are spread out into other jurisdictions in the right. state. Um, but at the same time, when you think about services and so forth that are needed, uh, you've put them at a disadvantage. Transportation um, expensive have incurred. So, I mean, it's a lot to really think about. And I think that part of what this report says to us is that we really need to rethink the future of housing and how we distribute um, opportunities and how we increase opportunities mm -hmm. for those who are, are in the greatest of need. And I was struck by, in the report, talking about those folks that are the severely cost burden. We saw the chart, <laughs> the 11 million renters. What that means is that they are struggling. They're making the toxic trade-offs. And without affordability, they're saying they're I think it was 53% less that they had to spend on transportation, health care, and basically food. Mm -hmm. Food is where that swing factor is. So those end up to pretty poor human and economic outcomes for our systems. So yeah. that's where I think we do need to see some of those kinds of shifts. And housing is so central to the biggest pocketbook issue, the biggest driver of place in our communities. It plays just that central role, I think, in, in driving some of these economics as well. So, Chris, if I just, uh, Mike, in terms of the, the chart that we showed about the concentration of poverty and how it shifted, one of the things we're trying to be sensitive to in the report is that there isn't a national story. Mm. These stories play out differently in yeah, different yeah. markets. Sure and so I just point out that that chart's available on our website, and you can look at it in different markets. And what you find is that in a place like Baltimore, it's very much an urban problem. It's, it's concentrated in the yeah. city of Baltimore, and the mayor has it at her front doorstep, and she could use some more help, I'm sure, from the surrounding Always. metropolitan yeah. area. <laughs> but then if you look at Atlanta, you look at Phoenix, the, the dynamic is very different. Um, the same thing with that rent distribution chart we saw earlier. Uh, so I think we're trying to highlight the fact that you know we, these are big issues, but they have to be tailored. I think someone mentioned earlier they have to be tailored to what's happening in the local market area because uh, and one of the reasons we wanted to highlight this issue about poverty spreading as well is there's a lot of focus now on gentrification. Gentrification is a real issue, and it's, it's yeah. very much a big issue in Boston, San Francisco, Washington, even places in Baltimore. Absolutely. But what doesn't get as much attention is the fact that the flip side of gentrification is this concentration of poverty neighborhoods. So we have to have a housing policy that deals not only with what do we do in places where people are being pushed out, but places that are underinvested. You know, and I think that, that we need to not only get people into areas of opportunity, but make more areas of opportunity. And housing policy has an important role to play in that. It's to be a both and strategy. Yeah, but I also think it means dealing with the, the ills of the communities as well. How do you deal with it in such a way that uh, you're not impacting one neighborhood against the other, mm -hmm. or that you're really cr creating equality across the board? You know, and, and I'm, I want to just mention, for example, when you think about drug addiction, and nobody wants drug treatment in their neighborhoods, whether you live in the Ritz-Colton or you live in Sandtown, Winchester. Right. But at the same time, how do you do it in such a way that it doesn't impact the neighborhood or that you don't pour all of that into one particular neighborhood? And I think that that's part of the discussion moving forward. Are we looking at drug addiction as an illness? And if we are, are we attaching it to hospitals that are not bumped up against neighborhoods and communities so that we can treat people and, and really cure the problems that they're facing so that they are productive members of any uh, community. And I think that's a real issue because people, when people talk about being exclusive, it's not so much exclusive that they want to be away from one race or the other. It's about the problems that are, are indicative of certain neighborhoods and communities that have not been addressed. And so it creates this I want to be separated or you know, deal with that problem over there and we'll act like it doesn't exist, but it does. And the, 
the long range impact of that is that if you're not fixing that neighborhood, eventually it pours out into your neighborhood as well. Right, the problems don't stay in neighborhoods. Uh, does anyone have any questions here for our panelists? One in the back over here, Chris. Okay, so if you want to ask a question, there is a clamshell kind of looking device on your table. If you just hit the button and make it turn green, uh, you can speak to us right there. I think that's how it works. Hi, I think this is working. Okay. Um, so early, earlier, we uh, the panel discussed um, HUD's uh, budget cuts. Uh, the, um, and one of the programs that's being cut, uh, one of the programs proposed is the CDBG, the um, that really benefits low-income housing programs and community development in general. Um, but critics of CDBG say that there's a lot of waste in that program, how a lot of money goes towards um, administrative costs, or they're just bad actors at the local levels. So, what are some ways that um, you all think? Uh, we could solve a lot of the corruption or the like bad actors at the local government levels to make these programs more efficient and more um, helpful for low-income communities. In case I need to restate that for the live stream audience, uh, 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 she is asking about uh, the CDG, CDBG program, which is uh, would be would be cut from from the HUD budget and criticism about CDBG. Um, Terry, is that something you want to address? Anyone else want to address? Sure. I mean, I guess I would just say that um, I would just be careful to say, to go back to say what has been the specific criticism of CDBG and what have actually the report said more specifically, because I think it's a common thought. There is certainly waste in, in certain government programs, no doubt, and reforms are needed. With CDBG, I'm not aware of specific yeah. reports that have said um, that it is, that there's something wrong with it. And I think most GAO accounting, you know, sort of of these programs have been that actually they're quite leveraged in bringing in public private partnerships and actually really thinking about that kind of leverage factor. And it's something in CDBG, I'd actually turn it more over to the mayor because I, I think what I hear, here we sit in the, you know, League of Cities, I, I do think that, you know, when this is one of those things that actually fulfills sort of the idea of taking also money and moving it to more state and local government and being able to use it in the most leveraged way for economic development. But it will look different from place to place, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not an inefficiency of the program. Rather, it's doing exactly what we want to do as we think about state and local strategies, which is tailoring it to the specific needs. And, and I would have to add that I can take you to communities in Baltimore where CBG uh, money was absolutely used in a way that has transformed neighborhoods and communities, whether it is the Audubon community or the Inner Harbor, uh, where you see transformation, or up in Mount Washington and Mount Clare, where you can just, uh, we can show you the transformation. Uh, I've not heard any complaints about that particular program. In fact, what we hear around the country and from other mayors is we wish we could get more. Uh, because in Baltimore, I think we were probably famous for the Dollar House program which that particular program enhanced and developed and helped us to expand and recreate neighborhoods that it had not been invested in for some time. So my hope is that we do reinvest and the federal government uh, does invest in that particular program because it is not just about building housing, it's about building communities and it does make a difference because not only does it create the housing, it creates the economic opportunities to do other things as well. Thank you. Let's take a question from the, from the Twitter bots. <laughs> okay, there are several questions on Twitter, um, but w one of them um, is directed at private private developers. And is it, I guess it's uh, slightly rephrasing, but is it possible or how can private developers profitably engage in affordable housing given the high, given the high development costs? Um, well, it's funny, we were having part of that conversation, I was having it with a member in the audience here earlier. What, what we're doing, we, we were seeking funds, to make it short, we were seeking funds to build a traditional real estate fund about two years ago, and we found ourselves misaligned with the capital markets doing that, that they were, they were looking for high rates of return to, to, to turn properties quickly, to, to do quick value add on high dollar properties. It was, it was really just a segment of the market that was, that's been, uh, I think, overinvested in, which is sort of renovations of 20 and 15 year old properties and trying to juice them up to sort of just under the luxury market. And, and there's an oversupply of that stuff now too. I, th I think the real opportunity is to go into 
secondary markets, tertiary markets, Savannah's, Birmingham's, uh, outer suburbs of Charlotte. We're looking at buying assets at significantly under their replacement cost and bringing them up to a almost new, not quite a new standard, but certainly a standard that can last, new appliances, new kitchens, new plumbing, that type of thing, and still be well under replacement cost with um, very strong capital investors, pension funds, those types of investors who are no longer just looking for the short return, but they're looking for the long return. So I think you're seeing a, a, the marketplace go back to more traditional investment in real estate, which is, which is not really a short-term flipping horizon, but one that you're really building a good stock of housing. And there's a tremendous, I, I don't know what the attrition rate on housing is, but it's like 1.1 million units a year sort of disappear from the, from the marketplace. We're only building 350,000 units a year. So to the extent that you can save that housing stock, we're under contract in Orlando to buy a completely vacated unit in an edge part of Maitland. And again, we will be building market rate housing, a thousand foot units at half the cost of the high rise building that's going to be right next door. Mm -hmm. We'll have rents a dollar under them. So we'll have, now that's not affordable, but those will be a dollar twenty-five, a dollar thirty cent rents versus two dollar rents. That's a family can get in there at thirty or thirty-five thousand. That's still an underserved marketplace. So uh, those are sort of privately financed options that we're looking at. And I would just say, Christian, that the um, one of the things the report points out is that you know, three quarters of uh, the units that low-income people live in are in the private sector already. And so what we have to make sure is that the private sector has the right incentives to, to invest and maintain that property. And so. You know, right now on the table we have tax reform, we have regulatory huh. reform. All these things have to be done with an eye of what are the incentives to invest in and maintain housing because it's so important to both the economy and to everyone's lives. Also, if we could accelerate programs like the 221D4 program where it doesn't take eight or ten months to get it approved, if you could have an approval process that could be fast-tracked, that'll cut a tremendous amount of costs and the returns on that are better and so you can rent them at a lower price, all without really having to have a subsidy. I want to try to see if we can take a couple more questions. We're kind of winding down. You had one, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, David Bowers with Enterprise. Question for Bob Kettler. Um, building on what you just said, Bob, is there a way to incentivize, is there a way to incentivize private investors, traditional investors, to reframe things so that they may look for lower returns, or is the answer going to have to be looking at quote unquote non-traditional investors um, to get into play? And, and I was curious for the mayor on the mm -hmm. public side, what strategies might work for us to be able to increase the state and local subsidy dollars coming in? What, what are the effective arguments? I have a little short answer. I don't want to cut into her time there, but we're trying to do ventures where there is a tax credit component that a tax credit uh, developer could come into and then we could do the market rate pieces of it. So that's a solution sort of in a mixed use to urban setting uh, that could be uh, successful where the public private partnership that doesn't look for yield like an investor uh, of a traditional multifamily market rate would look at. So that's a solution we're looking at. Um, and it's certainly the solution we're looking at. Um, when I think about again, uh, the Hopkins project, I think that was where Allen uh, Holmes came in um, because the subsidies were there and we were able to build single family homes uh, affordable and all of them are gone. And the same thing when we're looking at uh, cities, I think not only is it the subsidies that can help, and which is why I think cities are a great investment. When you think about all of us under federal mandate, for example, to fix our, 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 our under system, our pipe system and so forth. I mean, we already have infrastructure there, but to even to look at how do we incentivize developers to come in and say, well, you know, because we have to do this, we can incentivize this piece and then whatever other uh, tax credits or so forth that we can provide, uh, that's what you want to do, especially in areas where uh, development really needs to take place and, and home development is not taking place, but the opportunity is there, whether it is through the vacant housing market or properties that are being knocked down because we can't afford to do that now because of the dollars that we're getting at the state and federal level. Take one last question, ma'am, in the back. Yes. Um, thank you very much. This is very informative. We're going to try to turn on your mic here so we can all hear you. 
Hi, my name is Mina Marifat. I, uh, I teach at Georgetown, and I am uh, part of design research. Um, one of the most uh, covered events lately has been the huge fire in London. And a lot of it had to do with the failure of the sprinkler system, the safety measures. Uh, what kind of cautionary uh, <laughs> advice are we taking that for the, and what cities, state, federal uh, policies are there to promote and actually mandate maintenance of safety factors in large uh, communi communal housing as well as, you know, uh, rental housing, but how are we addressing that? Or are we taking this cautionary tale to prevent something like that from happening? We've had it happen in, in, in uh, buildings, maybe not to the scale of London, but what are we doing about that? Who is doing something about that? Want to speak about safety? I, don't know. Um, I mean, I would just say that you know, I think there's a lot of you know at the state and local, there's a lot of code enforcement and certainly making sure that we have that. But th it also spoke to me about how we design uh, housing is really important and can dramatically change the way uh, that a home provides you know either a healthy platform or an unhealthy platform. At its worst, in London, you know, a fiery um, death trap. Um, and so yeah. I think what we found, what, what I've heard so far in that is that the materials that were used actually made the fire spread more and that that use of those materials are things that we use here in this country. So, so certainly we need to make sure that um, as we look to, uh, particularly there's a big drive now to drive down the costs of housing, mm -hmm. super important because of, we're talking about the affordability issues at the same time, making sure the trade-offs that we're making are not compromising the safety of folks, whether it's in the materials, the design, or ultimately that we have also um, the right regulations and the right code enforcement to really keep people safe. And we're doing those inspections that we should be doing. Yes. I'll plug here uh, City Lab. What my uh, London-based colleague Fergus O'Sullivan has been covering this materials issue pretty closely, and I know he's got several more stories um, lined up on this specific topic. Um, we are out of time, but uh, this has been a great conversation, and I want to thank all of you here. If you'd like to see more after we leave, uh, you can check this out on um, hashtag Harvard Housing Report. You can also look at the report itself at jchs.harvard.edu. That's where you find it. OK. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.